on the edge of the United American frontier. Beyond the prying eyes of corporate greed, the moon lathe began as a beacon of hope. Idealistic colonists, yearning for a world untouched by the exploitation of megacorporations, saw Lethe as their Eden, a chance to build a society free from interference. Scientists and pioneers flocked to the moon, drawn by its potential and its untouched wilderness. But Lethe held secrets far more ancient and dangerous than anyone could have imagined. Hidden beneath its surface lay Xenocini, a vast and decaying metropolis older than any known civilization. It wasn't until miners, in their quest for the precious trimonite ore, broke through to the city's dark chambers that humanity first glimpsed the enigma of the ancients, a race forgotten by time, but bound to Leith's history in ways no one could comprehend. At the height of Leith's colonization, the discovery of trimonite, a rare and immensely valuable mineral, was hailed as the breakthrough that would bring prosperity to the settlers. Word of this discovery reached Wayland yutani the omnipresent corporate behemoth known for its ruthless pursuit of resources. The corporation, seeing an opportunity to exploit Leith's wealth, swiftly moved in, disregarding the dreams of the settlers. What had once been an isolated moon for idealists and scientists quickly transformed into a corporate stronghold. Wayland yutani imposed strict control over every aspect of life on Lathe. Mining operations were scaled up dramatically, and the colonists found themselves little more than laborers in their own land. The dream of an independent colony crumbled as the settlers were forced into grueling shifts in the Trimonite mines, their every move watched by corporate enforcers. Tensions grew, and the moon, once seen as a sanctuary, became a breeding ground for discontent. Jonas Harper, born and raised on Lethe, had grown up believing in the promise of the colony. He had seen his family and friends drawn to Leith by the hope of building a better future, only to watch as Wayland yutani stripped away their freedoms and turned their home into a corporate outpost. Harper had joined the Colonial Marines, partly out of a sense of duty and partly in the hope that he could help protect his home from the forces that sought to exploit it. As the years passed and conditions worsened, Harper found himself torn between his loyalty to the military and his sympathy for the growing resistance among the colonists. The breaking point came in 2177, when a faction of Lethe's miners, fed up with Wayland yutanis tyranny, planned a rebellion. They aimed to hijack the U.S. CSSS Montero, a cargo vessel docked at Leithy, and use it to escape the moon, spreading word of the corporation's atrocities across the galaxy. Harper, seeing no way to resolve the escalating conflict peacefully, was tasked with leading a team of colonial marines to suppress the rebellion. The miners fought bravely, but they were no match for Wayland yutanis firepower. The rebellion was crushed, and the Montero was grounded at Berkeley's dock spaceport. Many of the rebel leaders were executed or imprisoned, while the remaining colonists were forced back into the mines under even harsher conditions. For Harper, the aftermath was devastating. Though he had fulfilled his orders, he could not shake the feeling that he had been on the wrong side of history. The rebellion, while unsuccessful, had revealed the depths of despair among the colonists. Harper knew that Wayland yutanis grip on Latha would only tighten, and the Moon's people would suffer even more in the years to come. As the dust from the rebellion settled, Latha's miners returned to their work, driven by a combination of desperation and corporate pressure. It was during one such mining operation that they uncovered something far more valuable and dangerous than trimonite. Deep beneath the surface of the moon, the miners breached an ancient underground structure. What they found was a vast, eerie city, known as Xeno City, its walls fused with an alien, biomechanical architecture. Xeno City was no ordinary structure. It breathed, pulsated, and seemed to whisper through the stone itself. The ancients, towering humanoid beings, were inseparable from the city. Their bodies were interwoven with the very architecture, as though they had grown from the city walls like vines on a forgotten ruin. Skeletal remains, massive in size, were found embedded within the city's spires and pillars, with encrusted bodies fused to tubes and conduits that ran through the living architecture. Their features were grotesque, with elongated heads and bodies devoid of fully developed jaws or legs. Instead, their large pelvis bones supported their grotesque forms, while thin, almost fragile arms reached from the stone. Tubes, organic and mechanical, ran from their chests into their hollow, jawless mouths, suggesting that these creatures had evolved to be symbiotic with the city. Some believed that the ancients in the city were one, parts of a larger biomechanical organism that had long since died, leaving behind only fossilized remnants of its once great inhabitants. These creatures were theorized to be precursors to the engineers or space jockeys, a race of geneticists who may have played a role in shaping life throughout the galaxy. 
The ancient city, however, was far from a paradise. Some hypothesized that they had either bred the xenomorphs or had fallen prey to a rival species, perhaps the engineers themselves. Whatever their purpose, the xenomorph infestation had adapted to their peculiar morphology, turning the once thriving metropolis into a crypt of horrors. The origins of the ancients remained a mystery, but their connection to the xenomorphs was undeniable. Skeletal remains showed signs of infestation, with some ancients bearing the scars of face-hugger attacks. One of the more disturbing discoveries was the corpse of an ancient that had been impregnated by a large face-hugger variant. From its chest had emerged a creature unlike any xenomorph seen before, known as Titan. This massive xenomorph, born from the body of an ancient, was larger, faster, and more intelligent than its brethren. For centuries, Titan remained hidden within the depths of Xeno City, waiting for the moment it would be unleashed. The ancients, it seemed, had tampered with forces they did not fully understand. Their civilization had thrived for eons, only to be consumed by the very creatures they had sought to manipulate. The remains of their once great society were now little more than decaying ruins, haunted by the monstrous legacy they left behind. The initial excitement of miners over the discovery of an ancient alien civilization quickly gave way to horror. Among the ruins of Xeno City, the miners stumbled upon a nest of xenomorph eggs, dormant for untold millennia. In their ignorance, they triggered an outbreak. Facehuggers, awakened from their long sleep, latched onto the miners, impregnating them with the deadly creatures. By the time anyone realized what was happening, it was too late. The Pioneer Station, the hub of scientific research in the central colony on Lathe, became the epicenter of the outbreak. Xenomorphs swarmed through the station's corridors, killing or capturing anyone in their path. Anik spread as the colonists tried to flee, but the xenomorphs were relentless, cutting off all means of escape. Within hours, the station was overrun. As the xenomorph outbreak spiraled out of control, Wayland yutani activated the Cerberus Protocol, a last resort measure designed to contain catastrophic threats. Orbiting Leith were a series of defense satellites armed with nuclear warheads, placed there for precisely this kind of emergency. Without hesitation, the satellites launched their missiles, raining nuclear fire upon the surface of Lathe. The once thriving colony was obliterated. Pioneer Station, the Trimonite Mines, and much of Xeno City were vaporized in the blasts. The moon's surface was left scarred and irradiated, with only a few isolated pockets of life remaining. The Cerberus Protocol had successfully contained the Xenomorph threat, but at a terrible cost, the destruction of everything the colonists had worked to build. In the midst of this chaos, Jonas Harper's daughter, Cassandra, found herself trapped in what remained of Leather's surface. A scientist by trade, Cassandra had been researching the mysterious properties of Trimonite when the outbreak began. As Pioneer Station fell, she fled into the wastelands of Lethe, hiding from both the xenomorphs and the nuclear fallout. For Cassandra, survival was a brutal test of endurance. The once harsh but livable environment of Leith had become a desolate wasteland. With limited resources and the ever-present threat of xenomorphs lurking in the shadows, she scavenged the ruins of Pioneer Station, searching for any clues about the ancients who had once inhabited Xeno City. She soon discovered evidence that linked the ancients to the xenomorphs, fragments of data suggesting that the ancients had not merely fallen victim to the creatures but had perhaps played a role in their creation. These revelations haunted Cassandra as she evaded the roaming packs of xenomorphs, who seemed to be drawn to the remnants of Xeno City. As she navigated the crumbling ruins and the irradiated wastelands, Cassandra couldn't help but feel that she was being watched. The wrath of the xenomorphs pressed in from all sides, but the secrets of the ancients pulled her deeper into the heart of the moon's mysteries. She knew that something far greater than the outbreak was at play, a dark legacy hidden beneath the surface of Lethe, one that might change the fate of the galaxy forever.